Okay, ladies and gentlemen, the most important physiology question of all time. Which type of bicep curl is better? The incline curl, like so, leaning on an incline, eh? or the preacher curl? Now, I know every one of you are out there thinking, I know the answer, Andy, it's so obvious, and I do too, which is why I'm not even gonna tell you. Do I know you already know the answer? Instead, I'm going to focus a little bit more time on learning some cool physiology. All right, so again, I know you know the answer, but we'll do this five minutes real quick, talk about the physiology, and then you can show that to your friends who don't know the answer, and then they'll figure out which type of bicep curl is better. So let's get to that. What I'm talking about here, the major real difference between the incline and the, uh, the preacher curl is the amount of stretch the muscles put on. Now, I'm not talking about like stretching your bicep. Don't go do a bunch of bicep stretches. I'm not talking about stretching your hamstring before you work out. I'm talking about putting it on an acute stretch. All right, so understanding the difference in terminology here is going to help you get through this next couple of minutes. All right, so now... Muscles can only shorten by about 50% of their resting length. What's that mean? So if a muscle is already shortened about one joint, it can't contract forcefully over the other. So we know that some of the biceps cross the shoulder joint. We know all of them cross the elbow joint. That's the primary point, right? So if I am shortened about one of my joints, I can't contract fully over the other one. This is another way of saying a muscle that crosses multiple joints can't produce force over one when it's shortened about the other. This is why it's critical if you ever take any certification, especially like the NSCA CSCS, which I strongly encourage, they're gonna really hammer you on which muscles cross multiple joints. It's really important. You should be able to understand which calf of your calf, mu calf muscles cross both the knee and the ankle, because some of them don't. Some, they all cross the ankle, but some of them don't cross the knee. Same thing with the hamstrings, the quads, the elbow flexors and extenders. All right, that's really that stuff's really important because of this point. So we'll we'll do the calf example because it's the most common one. It shows up on basically every uh, CSCS exam ever. I almost guarantee you get this question if you take that exam. So take a look at like a seated calf raise. So here's what you notice: we know the soleus crosses the ankle joint. We know the gastroc crosses the ankle joint. They both turn into the Achilles tendon, right? And they insert in the bottom of your foot but the soleus starts like midway up your calf. You can see the image there. The gastroc crosses behind the knee joint. So they both contribute to you sticking your ankle out, which is called plantar flexion, but the gastroc is also involved in knee flexion. Interesting. So when we do a seated calf raise and we flex our knee, we know the gastroc really can't contract forcefully over the ankle because it's bent about the knee. So a seated calf raise is not a bad exercise, but it is pretty much a soleus isolator. Now that's not bad or good. It's fantastic if, for example, you're saying, man, I really need to do some ankle or calf work, but my knees kind of get irritated every time I do standing calf raises. You might know, oh, actually, maybe something's going on with the gastroc, so let me put you in this seated position. Oh, pain goes away? Yeah, entirely. Okay, then we know exactly what's going on. Or if for any other reason you feel like you need to isolate the soleus. The opposite could be an example though. If I do a standing calf raise like you see in the second picture, you know you're gonna get activity from both the soleus and the gastro. So there's never, it's never a right or wrong thing. It's always uh, we'll understand what's happening and then deploy appropriately. All right? So our answer to our original question, again, for your friend who couldn't figure it out by now, which one is better, the incline or the preacher curl? Well, I'll give you a couple of examples. Say you need to work on your biceps in general but you're complaining of shoulder pain, which one would you use? I'm not telling you, you better figure that out yourself. Another example, say you're using the bicep curl as a part of a general physical development program. Well, in that particular case, probably the incline is a little bit better because we're putting the muscle on more stretch, it's letting it cross both of its shoulder joints, and so we're gonna get the most even amount of work, as opposed to the preacher curl, which is gonna take the shoulder joint out of it, which is gonna let you isolate one muscle in particular. Now, I will give bonus points probably to anyone in class that can tell me which of those muscles we're talking about. So which is the bicep curl or the bicep muscle that's gonna cross the elbow joint only and not really in, uh, be implicated in the flexion of the shoulder. In fact, I think it's a quiz question, spoiler alert. Another example, if you're trying to, trying to get jacked. 
So say you're an amateur bodybuilder or competing in a show and you identify a specific part of your bicep that's behind. Well, then maybe you can address it because you now know, okay, if it's this part of my bicep, I put it in this position. But if it's that part of my bicep, I put it in that position. So hopefully you have an answer to how to optimize your bicep, but really more importantly, you understand the importance of how when muscles cross multiple joints, what that does to their contraction. You hopefully could do the same thing with your hamstrings. So examples here would be doing an RDL using the hamstrings that cross, cross the hip joint, but the hamstrings also cross the knee joint. So what happens and how does that change in RDL when you use a really big bend in your knee versus when you go a very stiff and extended knee? It changes it. It will change where you're sore at, I promise you. I know a lot of you that have done hinging stuff will feel that hinging when your knee's bent, but have you ever done it with a really aggressively locked out knee? Try it that way. It's different. Okay, the same thing happens at your quad, by the way. Think about a seated leg extension versus a squat where the hip is flexed and extended versus flexed the entire time. One of those quad muscles can't really work. Seated hamstring curl, tricep pushdowns versus tricep here, right? Putting the muscle on stretch or not. All right, so hopefully you learned something there. Uh, I really appreciate all you know the stuff here with YouTube to make it bigger and all that stuff. So do all the stuff, you know what to do. Thanks a lot.